Okay, so, so we're live now. So welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in for today's webinar. Our topic today is the future of medicine and how software improves healthcare. I have the great privilege of being here today with the amazing Professor Shafi Ahmed, who is a renowned surgeon, multi-award winning, a teacher, entrepreneur, futurist. And I want to thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Professor Ahmed. Thank you so much, Sanya. Uh, good to see you again. Um, we met a couple of years ago. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for allowing me to address the students at your university and having a conversation. I hope we get lots of interaction from them. I do too. Great. So I would like to begin with something that I think some of our viewers may not be entirely familiar with, which is the concept of a digital hospital. Because I myself wasn't aware with the fact that digital hospitals even existed a couple of years ago. And when I found out, I was completely amazed. So could you just paint a picture of a digital hospital and explain what a day in the life of a doctor who works there looks like? It's a, really, it's a really good question. It's a big question <laughs> at the beginning. So, look, I, I, I guess in the last uh, five years, we've seen the introduction of you know what we call exponential technologies uh, becoming more um, uh, becoming more available. There's more interest. And now we're seeing a translation of some of those technologies into clinical practice. So, and we're becoming in, a, in essence more digital. Yeah. So, if you look at every part of the hospital. For example, let's take the examples, the, the electronic health record. We now have a digital health record that connects with APIs to the labs, to x-rays, to images, where you can select all the information into one uh, definable health record, which then can be transferred across different sites, from hospitals to primary care, uh, et cetera. So it's becoming more connected. So that piece of information data becomes much more transferable and more valuable. And the other things we do, of course, is change the way we do things. We, we, we voice a write a lot of, on the notes and paper records. Now we've gone paperless, so it's all going to be uh, no paper. It's all computerized. We use computers and wall drive. We go around seeing patients. Well, no, computers constantly now, with mobile computers or even laptops, even iPads, etc., connecting everything. And then, of course, there's other technologies like um, how we monitor our patients. Uh, you know, if you take a temperature, pulse, etc. That can all be done with sensors now, where continuously we upload information to the system so you can get electronic recordings now of all those uh, important variable data for patient health and outcomes. On top of that, of course, um, in the last three months, which is, I think, really important, we've seen this pandemic drive that change for us. And now we're seeing the use of telemedicine, for example, just like this, video video contact, Zoom or whatever we decide to use, uh, increase in use. Six months ago, a year ago, it was hardly apparent. There's very few people doing uh, video consultations. And now that's gone up by 5,000% in the last three months. So you can see a sudden change, dramatic uh, increase in this technology. So what happens in digital hospital? There's no such thing. It's the hospital becoming more automated, and more data-driven. Um, it's required more software and more hardware, of course. And we're learning as we progress on this journey how to make that healthcare system better, more efficient. And that's really what we want to do is achieve uh, more affordability for people around the world uh, and also to make it more accessible, right? The other two things we've struggled with for many years. So this whole digital hospital concept is now becoming much more of a, I guess, say an aim that is achievable uh, and we're seeing that. So a number of things discussed and even the surgical world, we see the whole surgery chain, the robots coming in, help supporting your operations, using more analytics, for example. So every part of the hospital now is becoming digitalized. And so we're seeing an amazing uh, digital transformation of the entire health and care systems. So this saves a lot of time for doctors, which can be used to save human lives, right? Yes, it is. We waste a lot of time. A few years ago, we did a study where it showed that doctors, junior doctors, spent 70% of their time just filling out forms and writing things. Now look, you don't go to medical school five years, study endless hours to go and just keep writing forms out. It's not really what we're achieving. So you take some of the automation away, the doctors can then do the job they're trained for, which is looking after patients, making clinical decisions, uh, operating if they need to in terms of surgery. So it frees up spare capacity and spare time and helps use the workforce in a more efficient manner. 
So these are the fundamental changes that are taking place, of course, in that context. So you mentioned you use robots. What kind of robots do you usually use? I know that you're using a robot while performing surgery, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, in the last, I guess, about 20 years ago now, around 2000, uh, the first robots were coming out from America. And these were um, uh, designed by a company called Intuitive Surgical. And you may have heard of the Da Vinci robots that have been used uh, widely for 20 years. And they were really ahead of the game. They were trying to figure out how to improve the accuracy, take away some of the tremor, um, make the pictures much more uh, better for us in terms of visualizations. So there's improvement in the actual operation itself. The last one is they've disseminated to become now, not routine practice, but certainly a lot of hospitals offering robotic surgery. And about two or three years ago, what happened is that in two lost some of their patents for the robot, and now it's an open market. We're getting five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 companies around the world all now making robots, yeah? So for example, in the UK, we've got uh, Cambridge Medical Robotics, which is a great company based out of Cambridge University, not too far from there. We're now creating a sleeker, smaller design robot. We have Medtronic, we have Johnson Johnson, working with, uh, with Google to create the Verb robot, which is more data-driven, yeah? So now we're seeing a, a playing field that's much more broad. And hopefully what that happen is that robots become cheaper, uh, smaller, more mobile, uh, and more affordable as these kind of robot wars take place in 2020. So it's going to make us, um, uh, hopefully, in, in the context, a uh, better able to perform delicate money operations and improve some of the operations that we couldn't do before. So it's an exciting time in surgery where robots are really going to transform uh, our lives. And some people use robots in the hospital. And I was in South America, of course, working uh, to build a hospital with the government there. And they're trying to get robots in that can actually deliver things around the hospital. So, for example, you could uh, order something. Uh, the robot literally would go around the wards and drop off supplies to you. Yeah, take away some of the manpower that may be required. Yeah. So, people now think about automation. How we can use a mixture of robotics and human workforce to make it better. Of course, this is the early days. This is a few hospitals trying to experiment to push the forward. It's not routine, of course, in clinical practice. And more importantly, we're seeing drones now. Drones delivering things, yeah? Who would call drones now? Uh, I think about a year ago, they delivered a transplanted kidney from one part of America to the other so they could be done quicker, so there's less time in the car, so it could be put into the body much quicker, much faster. And that was done first in America last year. We're seeing uh, drones supply. If you go to Rwanda, for example, in Africa, they have a central repository of all the blood products in one place, and drones actually fly out from there delivering the bloods as they need them. So it saves people money and expertise, and also it makes it more efficient. And throughout the run now, it's a consolidated drone service that supplies blood and blood products, which is now being pushed out in parts of rural America. So these are the kind of things that happen that are so exciting. Uh, they're making mm -hmm. the healthcare, I guess it's making the world a fairer place because it's, it's converting our knowledge uh, into a, a similar uh, environment. We can share that experience. Experience. This is why it's so important to speak to your students about how they can change that world with us, of course, with their amazing skills in, in technology and computers and software engineering. Right, exactly, exactly. This is really interesting. So do you think soon we'll have that kind of robots in every hospital? It'll take a while. I think it's too expensive still. Um, it's not affordable. I mean, if you think about a machine at the moment, uh, a robot for surgery costs upwards of about over a million, in some cases over two million um, pounds. So euros, about 2.5 million euros. It's quite expensive for a lot of people to have that capital in the beginning. But each operation member requires uh, reusable, so we use instruments which have to replace after certain times, and that adds costs, making it more expensive. So until that price point comes down further, where it becomes more affordable, then it won't democratize um, uh, surgery at all. It's still going to be mainly private hospitals or public hospitals that have resources that push the boundary. Uh, and the penetration at the moment is no more than 10, 20%. So we've a long way to go before we think about how we push out to the rest of the world. We're not ready for this moment. Right. So except for robots, you're using VR a lot, right? Yes. Yeah. And I heard that you're using VR while operating to alleviate the pain <laughs> of the patient. How does that work? So, um, 
So VR is interesting, and I, I talk about VR widely as kind of my, one of my interests. In the last five years, we've talked about how not just VR, the VR and AR, and the whole um, concept of the extended reality, yeah, including mixed reality. As you know, AR is one extreme where you get overlays information um, into a glass, for example, into wearable tech. On the other side, you've got virtual reality, which is immersive and completely embedded into, your, uh, into a headset. And then when you've got mixed reality, there's a whole spectrum. So all of these things I'm seeing are now being, uh, being used. So I had VR back in 2016. We, uh, when it first came out, we're literally making, we've got three or four GoPro cameras. <laughs> we, we 3D printed a, a kind of a, a scaffold for them. We put them in, figured out how to, uh, uh, how to record them and then stitch together a 360 video, right? And it took a whole week to stitch one video, right? Now you can do it instantaneously and a button that does it all for you. Right? And so we learned a lot from those few years. And so we recorded lots of live uh, 360 videos, operations, etc. And we did the world's first streaming live operation in 2016, where we actually pushed out its operations to the world, uh, which is watched by about 50,000 people, training on mass, if you like. So where VR has come in now, it's shown, so education is great. We can learn and teach. And now we're seeing this pandemic, people crying out for virtual learning, like Zoom um, and and now they say, can we go to VR training, etc. So now we're seeing a huge interest in the whole platform. In terms of therapy, this is the crucial one. About two years ago, I was really unsure about the future of virtual reality. We weren't seeing the content, we weren't seeing the use cases. Headsets were expensive and cumbersome. And each company was kept producing new headsets. Every six months, new would come out, right? And, and the thing, we can't drive the industry through just headsets. It has to be the software and the content that drives change. So about two years ago, um, some people that I know, some in Belgium and also from Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles, were shown that they could do therapy with virtual reality, treat patients in VR. So now we're seeing use cases for phobias, anxiety, stress disorders, um, for even blood pressure, hypertension, uh, for other illnesses. We're seeing that for mental health. We're seeing this use of VR and showing that it's effective in patients, which is a game changer. So Suddenly, clinically, we're seeing a great um, use that's going to drive VR. Now I'm happy as we move forward. In terms of pain, we realized that with VR, for example, there's two things happen. One is initially a few years ago, there was a great um, uh, company who created a video uh, for children who had essentially burns, so quite severe degree burns. They required dressing chains regularly. So they created a video. The video in VR, where you can navigate through an icy plane, so snow and ice, lovely landscape, playing like gamification. So that, that was supposed to cool the patient down because it's ice, right? And the burns are quite hot. Then what they showed by doing that, when they're going for dressing changes, the children required less painkillers. Oh, just by looking the, at pictures of ice. And, and playing gamification. Mm -hmm. It's distractive therapy. So you're seeing ice, and that's cooling it down. It's mm -hmm. about mind change. Also, so because you're gamification, you're concentrating, it takes away the kind of the edge of the discomfort. So they showed that pain could be improved or you have less pain, killer, which is a great thing for children. Now we're seeing only this year that they were doing a similar thing with the women in labor. So when women go to labor, they often get after epidurals for pain or painkillers. They're actually just doing VR therapy for women in labor about to give birth. They found actually we could overcome some of the uh, pain requirements, right? Uh, and now we've done some, some work around that as well, around surgery, post-op recovery, where VR adds value. And also what VR also allows you to do, say after an operation, is rehabilitation. You can imagine if you're lying in bed and you're a bit uncomfortable, you can do motions, you can rehabilitate your upper body, right? While you're lying there in VR. And as you walk around, you'll be able to improve. And uh, for orthopedics, for example, um, you could, if you've had an operation in orthopedic, you can actually help yourself get back to normal health quicker because you can mobilize in the VR, move muscles and joints that are required to move. So the, so what's happened now, of course, is a huge, um, I guess, um, uh, is a huge industry now where VR is going to help both education, so that's all education, including medical education, mm -hmm. but importantly, therapy. And soon you'll be able to prescribe, just say a patient comes to you as a doctor, you normally look at them, you examine them, you might prescribe some tablets, in the future, you say prescribe VR therapy for two weeks. 
for example, okay? And that's coming, okay? So suddenly you have to prescribe the R therapy and that takes away the side effects, the drugs, the effects of it, yeah? That actually makes it more effective. As long as we can get the price now. So at some point what happened is that the, 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 the payer, the insurance company or the government will pay for that service like it pays for the medication. So that's where I think this year we'll, we'll see those exchanges take place. Great, this is truly revolutionary. I, I never thought that someday we'll have VR treating patients. Yeah. So no, me, me neither, me neither. <laughs> we kind of come here really quickly, right? What, what would you say is the most advanced technology that you're using when treating patients? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> I guess they could do, so on the surgical side, I guess you know, we do robotic therapy, robotic surgery, which is really advanced. We've got big machines uh, working amazingly well in tiny holes and movements are just amazing and producing data. And the other thing we're really doing now, which is more sophisticated, is driving data-driven healthcare. So look, we're getting more and more uh, information on patients, right? Whether they use wearable sensors, whether it's genomic data, trying to look at the genomic profiling. Uh, so we're now looking at patients in a different light and create what's called personalized or precise medicine. So you know that that patient is going to respond to that treatment, particularly in cancer, right? Mm -hmm. So cancer, we know, is a, a heterogeneous kind of illness. It doesn't affect everyone the same way. Uh, some people are, are improved by chemo, others aren't. What is the biology? Well, that takes back to my PhD. I did my PhD on genomics and cancer in 2000, looking at profiling. How can we stratify patients better using genomic data? But it won't be that with genomic data, it would be physiological data, and probably lots of data that's combined to create this model where we can create much more sophisticated models of care that's much more specific. So that's kind of, I think, where we are now, which is exciting. And that's obviously much more, um, I guess, uh, for the long term, it'll make more patients benefit from the therapy they've been given. So I'd say that was a, a clever piece of um, technology that's coming together in various sources to treat people. Right, so we have all of this technology today, which already seems surreal. I read earlier today that we have a robot called Xenex that uses ultraviolet light to kill up to 70% of bacteria in hospital rooms. It's yeah. truly amazing. It's amazing how far we've gotten. And I am sure that 50 years ago, no one even considered that today we'll have robots helping you perform surgery. No. And it's really hard to imagine what could improve and what technology has even more to offer in the future. And it's interesting to hear how you envision the digital hospital of tomorrow and what do you think can still be improved? So I think what we found today is there's a, so let's talk about the pandemic, what it's shown us. Um, I'll give my examples in the UK and abroad. The pandemic has been really important in showing up the gross inequality of healthcare. That's been what we found. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's a divide between rich and poor that we're not giving care for the most vulnerable people in the country. They've been left alone, they've been left alone to die, uh, and the support services haven't been there. So what is highlighted is that huge discrepancy in care that we never thought was always there, but it's never been that as visible. And also we're seeing the care around ethnic population. We talk about the BME, we talk about this kind of the Black Lives Matter movement. Actually, what was found in the pandemic was so that the people from a, a black and minority ethnic background have had high incidence of deaths, high incidence of um, illness. Again, showcasing disparity. So I think that's the big challenge for us, the context of inequalities. And the other thing that's shown us, of course, is that the, I think the shocking care in social care. So we worry about healthcare, we worry about secondary care, and we worry about sickness. We're not managing is wellness, care in the community, the people that are much more vulnerable in society. I'm hoping what it teaches now is to maneuver some of the resources to deal with those fundamental issues that we have before us. Yeah, rather than spending a lot of money on just technology, it's how do we make that health system much fairer? So I think that's the, the learning that I take from the pandemic. We'd love to get a position where we look after people's mental health, yeah, their well being, and manage wellness much better than we have. And preventing people getting to hospitals, which is expensive, and actually late stage, too late almost, right? For a lot of people, because you're managing the acute episodes. How do we make people happier? So what we've also found in the pandemic is of course people, for example, with chronic diseases, 
like diabetes, like asthma or chronic airways disease. Before they'd go to various hospital appointments and now they're managed in the community, okay? Much more than before. So now they're managing on their own with sensors, wearables, apps, software solutions, telemedicine, so they can see someone directly. So the whole management of chronic disease is going back into the community at people's homes. So we, we move the whole needle along where now we're seeing how the health and care needs to be reestablished and reimagined. Technology has a fundamental role in that uh, to play to ensure that that becomes much fairer. So those are kind of my musings, if you like, in the last three months, where we've come from and where we ultimately need to be. And I'm sure in Bulgaria, it's the same. I'm sure we've seen the same experiences mm -hmm. of how healthcare has affected those uh, most vulnerable and what we support them as well as we should. Right. So we have a question from our viewers. Uh, from Boris. Hello, Professor Ahmed. I would like to ask what are the biggest challenges of today's medicine and how can they be overcome with technology? I think we partly, um, yeah. we partly answered that question, but would you like to add something? Sure. So first of all, it's important that technology is, is supporting, it augments, it improves, it adds value. It's not the solution for everything. We have to get in balance. Healthcare itself is driven by humans, also with patients, um, and we need to improve that using technology as an interface. Yeah, and making sure that relationship uh, is quite solid. So that's kind of where we are. And the challenges that we faced before, I said before, is the inequalities of healthcare, is how to make healthcare more affordable. How do we globalize healthcare? A lot of my work, as you know, um, uh, Sanya, is on a global level. So to the audience, I, I've been to about 35 countries in the last three and a half, four years, working with governments, colleges, ministries, universities to think about how we reimagine healthcare systems. So I've learned a lot about work in China and India and other places. There's a lot of good stuff going on, a lot of amazing work has been carried out in pockets of innovation. What we're seeing is a uniform approach. So with the pandemic, for example, again, going back to that example, each country was doing its own thing, lockdown, managing its uh, track and tracing, and managing restrictions. But actually, we didn't learn as a, as a global community of what worked better. We know China has been through Ebola, has been through MERS and SARS virus, Africa's had Ebola virus in the past. How can we didn't learn from that? How can we work ready to manage our pandemic? We knew it's coming. So I'm hoping what we, the biggest challenge is bringing that global community together, learning from one another to ensure that we make less mistakes ourselves, and taking those great learning of innovation around the world. Uh, and supporting our own healthcare system. So the challenge really is that global community. This is where I think you guys come in. People like Sally yourself, Software University. You're fundamental. It's about that private public partnership. How do we work together? Whether it's engineers, with computer scientists, doctors, what is it we do together to create that healthcare system? Yeah. Okay, great. So we have uh, a comment here. It's not, not a question, but a comment. It is amazing to see doctors and programmers work together. And I absolutely agree. And um, in a way, aren't software engineers also saving lives by creating the technology which helps doctors do their job more efficiently? Absolutely. There's no question. We save lives together. There's no question. We're in this a collab we're in a partnership. And um, so look, one of the things I've been driving for a while Medicine has always been taught um, through a hierarchical. Uh, our curriculum at medical school has been very ancient for a long time. It hasn't changed appreciably in terms of the teaching. Um, we teach the same way. I mean, medicine still now is a five or six year program. Okay, uh, Sonia, if you can tell me why it's still five, six years in 2020, I'd be grateful to hear it. Because why can't we train doctors in three years, three and a half years? They don't need to know as much language because now, they use Google, they use their smartphones, they, they learn in different ways. We need to learn everything again because it makes no sense, right? So that's the first thing. So one thing I just, one of my roles I have is uh, I have been the Associate Dean of our medical school, Barts. And Barts is an old institution. Uh, we've, as a hospital, been around since about 11, 27. So it's quite old in terms of hospital. And we have a medical school that's about 250 years old. But the curriculum hasn't really moved forward for decades. So about four or five years ago, uh, I said, I'm gonna change the curriculum. So what we did, I introduced something called the Barts X program. The Barts X program was basically a program for everybody in the medical school in their third year embedded. And what, what we brought to them was this, and um, I want to teach them to be a, a future digital doctor, right? So we brought in coding, 
app design, development, UI, UX. We talked about how to make a business case. We talked about the technologies. We brought in computer scientists, engineers, business people to talk to them. We then asked them to form groups of four or five to form a little um, group of an idea, generate ideas, uh, innovate, then go away with their mentors from the tech industry and engineering industry and their medical school, engineering school and computer school to design something in the space of two months, which then they came to a Dragon's Den pitch to make it work. So they had a crowd funding and then we went to a pitch to see who won. And the winners were given a three month place for the tech company to make it work. So once I brought in the engineers, computer scientists, the biologists, um, and, and also the doctors, and that suddenly we had this forging of ideas. I was the first medical school in the world to embed this into a program, yeah? I felt that we should embed it. So it's now four years now, it's been very successful. And I'm glad I was head of the game. Now people say, how do we do this? We did it four years ago, because I saw the vision where the pandemic has shown us this is what we need to do. So, my, so one of the things we should be creating in the future is that a doctor, it's like a medic, medic, medic near, if you like, right? Make sure you're a doctor and an engineer, yeah? Or even a medic scientist, a computer scientist. So skills that, that, they don't have to have the skills. They don't have to be computer coders. They have to understand how they can work together. It's that collaboration. That's the only way of going forward to have those skills. So I'm very much of the, of the opinion that each, each medical school, if it's a university, has, has the ability to foster those relationships with the engineering department, computer department, et cetera, bring them together. And in fact, at our medical school now, one of the students, for example, they've gone and done amazing things with voice tech, uh, with AI interfaces, with VR. And one of them has just built drones with the university so they can deliver some products to the hospital. All come about because we're redesigning their minds, replugging the engineering, and rewiring their minds and mindset to get the opportunity to, to think differently. And that's so important, of course. So speaking of education, you have contributed a lot about um, teaching thousands, maybe even millions of surgeons around the world using VR, Google Glass, and all kinds of technologies, really. Um, how, how did the idea of that come across? <laughs> well, what a good question. So I've always been troubled by um, how we've been too traditional in medicine. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've always, one of my statements I often give to people is that medicine is almost stuck and limited by a dogma and tradition, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's been our problem for many years. We're very comfortable, mm -hmm. we're risk averse. We, we, we don't want to move because we've just, we're comfortable with what we have. Uh, I've never been comfortable. Always we could push hard. How do we push? How do we constantly change our mind? I often ask the audience this one question. I say to them, how many of you in the audience uh, want to be mediocre, okay. And surprisingly, no one ever puts their hand up, <laughs> okay? And I say to them, okay, unless you challenge every process that you're doing every day, redesigning it, improving it, by definition, you're accepting mediocrity. So you are mediocre, right? Unless you're changing, designing, improving. So that's the mindset shift we have to, we have to develop. So going back to this, um, you look at surgery, the way we're teaching surgery in the operating theater, we had, you know, we had four or five students in the room, we're busy, it's difficult to get a view from a student's perspective. And most of the time, the eight hours that they're in the operating room, they're actually on their smartphone in the back of the room being ignored. They're not even part of the, they might as well not be there, right? So we kind of ignore them. And we've done that for decades, thinking that's a good way of teaching. And so I always say this thing that actually, we teach them by a process of what's called osmosis and diffusion, right? It's kind of this knowledge that dissipates in the room somehow, right? No active learning. It's not a good use of people's time. So I thought, okay, I can do better. As I'm operating, why don't I stream to many people around the world using Google Glass, using social media, Snapchat Spectacle, et cetera, or VR. So we did all the experiments that I can teach more people. And my passion was around how do I share knowledge, breaking barriers, uh, breaking the geopolitical barriers that we have so that anyone around the world can access education that's high quality. That's what people deserve. I always felt that a fundamental human right is access to information and knowledge. Yeah? And we, of course, as doctors, and I'm sure you'll tell you, you want, you want to leave a legacy, you want to share knowledge on a global level, leave it of course. as many people as possible. That's what we have. So why not, why not think bigger? Why share one person next to you? Why not share it with millions of people? Okay, what's that barrier? How do we change that barrier? Everyone's connected. Everyone's a smartphone. Everyone's a 2G, 3G, 4G, now 5G connections. So you just find that the platform. So what happened back in 2014? Suddenly, 
the technology was available. It wasn't available five years before that, right? So suddenly everything came together, right time, right place, and technology, et cetera. So that's like pushing out the stream live, all these kind of things. And it, it, it made a big difference to people. I can share operations with tens of thousands of people. So the Google Glass operation we did was watched by 15,000 people, and I was trained 15,000 every day while I was doing the Google Glass operations. In virtual reality, we trained 55,000 people. With Snapchat Spectacle, the social media platform, I taught over two and a half million people. Because suddenly you're, it's a language, it's a new language. It's not, I'm, I'm getting on a bit, I'm old now. You've got to think about the young people like yourself, Sandhya. What do you use? What's your, what's your modus operandi? What, what does drive you? You have access to great platforms that can be used for sharing knowledge. So we experimented with Facebook Live, with Instagram, with Twitter, the world's first Twitter operation, etc. And all the time experimenting to push the boundaries of what was expected and what's acceptable. And thankfully, it seemed that the world and the public were ready for this democratization of education. And now we're seeing now the online education, everyone's looking for online education. It has come through. Um, so, um, so that's been interesting. One last concept I'll share with you about the pandemic is that I didn't think we'd be here in 2020, a year ago, okay? What the pandemic has done, and I, I share this image from Final Fantasy IV, which is a game. I never played it, but I came across it the other day. They talk about the compression of time. Time has been compressed. So what would have taken two to five years has now taken three months. The door's open. Technology is coming in. We're innovating. People are ready for change. Yeah. So what we're seeing now is that drive. And now this is what's called the new normal. We won't go back to healthcare of the old. We're pushing an open door to innovate rapidly the next year. So I think it's really exciting. So people talk about pandemic being, and of course, it's depressing seeing the death around the world. I think there's opportunity. This be positive. How do we make that world a better place now? In the context of where we are, and digital transformation is very much part of it. Absolutely. So nowadays, you just need to have, um, you just need to be willing to learn, and as long as you have internet, you can learn anything. Absolutely. Precisely. Precisely. Uh, so what's interesting to hear is um, when the new technology for the medical field is being developed, how do medical practitioners and software engineers work together to create it? And if you could just lead us through this process and um, who gives the ideas here? Because as a software engineer, um, someone can, can give one idea and as a medical practitioner, another person can give a totally different idea. Yeah, so absolutely. So this is about perspectives. So one thing about, say, how, say doctors, let's take an example. Um, we are very much, we, we need support from other industries. We don't have the skills, okay? We have to accept, accept we have certain skills in medicine and, and that's what we train for. We're not computer scientists. We're not business developers. Uh, we're not engineers, okay? So what it tells me about the world that we live in, and the key word is collaboration. So you may have an idea. So I have a great idea. I want to develop this tool for something. Right? Where do you go? But you, you have a network of people, right? So you bring other perspectives. So one of the great things we've done with our part text program is bring doctors, engineers, computer science together. And, and when you have those conversations, the mind just explodes. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Oh, that's how you, okay, that, you can do this. In this conversation, suddenly that idea becomes fermented and suddenly it becomes uh, applicable because you get the different minds working together. And so I learn a lot from that. So I think collaboration is the key. So the way to do that, is, so an engineer might be having an idea. You know, I want to do something in healthcare. A great idea for a technology that might work. Well, find the right network. Find that doctors are interested with you, who are passionate about innovation. Find people in business who can support you. You need that kind of support structure, a group of people to make that change. You can't do it individually. And sometimes um, you're limited by your own abilities. And to understand, to understand that, bringing expertise when you can. So for example, I, I run Medical Reality as a virtual reality company. I have a few startups. And so I'm limited. I know about what VR can do. So we brought the VR team in, the graphic designers, uh, we brought the healthcare professionals in, et cetera, uh, CG animators, all the people that could put their thoughts together to create the product. And of course, then you need business acumen to go to market to make it work, right? So, so that's how you do things. So I'd say startup community is really exciting. A lot of doctors now think about portfolio careers, about doing two or three different jobs during a lifetime and collaborating. So we're seeing a huge interest 
in do doctors and healthcare workers who want to work outside medicine with these kind of startups. But we're seeing the same from other industries. So it's a really nice environment now to be in uh, where it's encouraged. 10 years ago, this would never be encouraged. You had to go through your health care. My, my career was very much surgery only, 120 hours a week, for many years with nothing else around it. The site has changed. There's part-time work, that's for working. People make lifestyle choices, etc. I think about how they design. And of course, enabled by technology as it's been coming in past. Um, I read that you're working on a special glove right now, which Ooh. can uh, mimic the the sensations you're you're feeling. Is yeah, that so yeah, so virtual reality is good. Virtual reality is amazing because uh, the first time you do it, it's often you have the the, the, the headset you can see in three sixty. Mm -hmm. Very much at that point, four years ago, it was limited because it was just standalone. You have to turn around and look, and there's amazement around it as well. Then what happened, of course, over the last year, we had the, uh, the, the introduction of six degrees of freedom, which is amazing. Suddenly, you can walk into VR, you can walk around, the room moves around with you. That gives that spatial awareness. That's a big change to dramatically improve what VR experience is like. And thirdly, we're looking at the tactile impression, where you can actually get your hands, see your hands as they are in front of you. You'll be able to feel pressure sensors, and um, so Oculus done quite well with the kind of the, um, uh, the hand identification. It's, it's pretty good. Now we've been working for a few years, whereas companies working on gloves that can mimic pressure so you can start feeling in that space. Still some way to go. Um, they haven't really got to the level where they can be used routinely. I have another two to three years, and perhaps we'll have something much more substantial we can now feel. So my whole inference was many years ago, if you could be in the VR space and say you simulated an operation, so a simulation, could you put some gloves on, make an incision with your fingers and the scalpel, feel the tissues, react the tissues? Could you replicate this operation but in VR with simulation? And that's kind of where we're getting towards uh, as the pinnacle of training. And imagine that, that would revolutionize the way we train the surgeon. You could do the operation um, in virtual reality with all the sensations required. And then once you're competent, then go to the OR and do it for real, yeah? And so at the moment, we're going to the OR and doing it for the first time, right? Uh, which is no good for the patient, right? <laughs> and because you're learning from scratch, yeah. So when you graduate, you've already performed so many operations, although it wasn't yeah. really you, it was some other doctor, but using VR, you, you can course. experience it. That's, that's really. what we're heading towards. And that makes sense, it entirely makes sense. So we have a couple of questions um, about this topic. One of them is, what is technology you wish you had right now, but is still not developed? <laughs> the VR glove, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, I think, um, so, I, so I have this um, bodysuit at home. I, I should have put it on for you. I have an old bodysuit <laughs> called the Tesla suit. And that it basically is pressures everywhere. It gives you the sensation that you're in a, it's like, um, it's like, I guess, what is it? Yeah, so you have a complete pressure suit and then you have the gloves, the headset, everything else, and you're immersed. Now, I'd love that to be much more realistic and lifelike so you can actually immerse yourself in the VR world. And the other technology I think we probably need is probably quite advanced um, uh, analytics where we can um, probably analyze a surgical operation in much more detail. So for example, for example say you're performing an operation and you're looking around into the body, for example, we are going to have a navigation tool. Yeah. Say, so say, that's this, that's that, that's the data structure, this way you should be going, helping you navigate to the operation, making it less risky and making it um, more, uh, more accurate. I'd love to have a facility where we can, we can literally today go in and navigate and manage that operation in a different way. Uh, we're some years away from that. And another question about that topic. Uh, are you already using mixed reality in the operating room to see a person's um, uh, prescript um, descriptions? Or I don't know, it, it doesn't say really. Yeah, sure. So look, um, there's a few companies already have um, American FDA approval for the augmented reality platforms, MR platforms in their OR. So for example, now you can actually uh, put the images into your headset overlaying the patient. So for example, it could be the patient's spine, for example, we're injecting, the spine would appear 
tell you where you should be injecting, giving that kind of this roadmap. Uh, and we're seeing the same in orthopedics, where you can have a, a broken bone, for example, which can be then reconstituted in front of you, and you can see where you need to fix it, how to fix it. And, and those are now approved by regulatory bodies as being HIPAA compliant than others. So we are seeing that being used. Not routinely, we're seeing pockets, but it won't be long before it's used much more commonly by many specialties. The fidelity isn't quite there. It's not as good as it should be at the moment. Um, the quality isn't as good either. It's not as accurate. Those things are just small measures that will, will change uh, with the help of scientists and engineers, etc., right, to make it better for us. So that within the next two to five years, it becomes much more commonplace. But certainly, when I was doing it three, four years ago, I was the only one. Now we're seeing many companies out there pushing the boundaries uh, and making it happen. So if, if you have an urgent operation, you can just go through a person's background right away and don't have to waste any time, right? Yeah, you could, you could, you could actually practice your mind, do it, put the videos and images, figure out how to manage it, et cetera, uh, which will help with pre-planning. We should make the operation more smoother uh, once you're in the operating room. In some cases. So another question. It's great that you like to think out of the box and come up with these ideas, but are there moments when you think the risk is too high and how do you cope with it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So look, I guess when you're innovating, um, you have to be also pragmatic. Ultimately, it's about the patients um, and their safety, always. Uh, and the patients have to be the center part of any journey. Yeah. And we try to support a patient-centric healthcare system. So whenever I do these innovations, we think long and hard. I speak to the right teams, the ethics teams, the governance team, the leadership team, and the medical team, the legal team. So what are we doing? Is it correct? Are we pushing the boundary in the right way? Are we just being uh, disruptive just for being disruptive? Are we, are we a danger? Are we doing, so are we, I have to go through the motions thinking about what is I'm doing? And am I being safe enough? Once I've had those discussions, and we think about it logically, then what we do is mitigate risk. There's always gonna be a small risk in anything that you do. If you mitigate it as fast as possible, think about all of the options available to you, minimizing it, and get consent from patients that's sensible, that's honest, yeah, and transparent. Then I think you can innovate, but you have to constantly think about it. When I do innovate, I then stop and reflect immediately. Say, okay, what did I do? Was the right, do we push the right, Andrew, what's the right thing to do? And what's the criticism? Listen to people's criticisms. Say, okay, what can we do better? So I'm someone who reflects a lot on these things, ensure that what we do is the right thing, that we're not just being cavalier and maverick, that it's in the patient's best interest, and there's an aim at the end of it, that either improve outcomes or help people being edu educated. So it's a, a process of that. Um, and sometimes you, know, you have to be concerned about uh, how you go about doing this. But I'm very reassured, I'm very happy with what I've done the last five years, that we have been sensible. I've had support from the right people to drive that innovation. And we've, I think, in, in hindsight, done very well with good outcomes and the results. Yeah? But again, that can change in a moment. You know, these, these things can change by the minute. And it's very different when you're creating technology for the medical field because the risk is really high there and you have to test it the right way to ensure that the patients are safe. Of course, of course. So another question, uh, thank you for the interesting facts you share with us. Do you think global pandemics such as COVID challenges and changes the future of technologies and medicine? Yeah, undoubtedly, yeah, there's no question. But we've moved on, as I said before, this is the new normal for us. Right. We've accelerated. So when I say the pandemic, as I mentioned before, it's squeezed time, it's compressed time. It's also allowed us to leapfrog healthcare systems. It's catapulted, it's accelerated, it's, it's moved us on to different trajectory, which we can't grab back from. So that's the first thing. And we're learning from that. Um, and we use the technology in different ways. For example, um, test, track, and isolate, just a, in smartphone, geolocation, uh, patients who may have infections or, uh, or people they're in contact with. It's all done through an app now, through systems. Etc. So that's kind of improved the way we manage a pandemic, which we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen fast track uh, 3D printed. We saw ventilators being printed or parts of ventilator because of lack of resources. We saw PPE being 3D printed by various companies. So that you know, protection. So we see the way the community came together so that we can drive innovation in our need. We can create this stuff very quickly. And so I, I think it has helped us. Um, and without the pandemic, these changes were taken two to five years. 
I'll give you an example. Say three months ago, so I'm a cancer specialist and a cancer surgeon. I, I break bad news to many patients. And who would have thought, say three months ago, I'd be breaking bad news to a patient with a cancer diagnosis on a telephone or through telemedicine. If I said to you, I'm going to tell someone of their bad diagnosis through just the telephone, you would have criticized me. So why are you face to face? This is so um, um, disrespectful and frankly wrong. Now, we're routinely breaking bad news for telemedicine. Patients now are demanding more access to healthcare, i.e. through telemedicine. They're, they're ready. I think we were too paternalistic. We were too worried about change. Now the patients are demanding that change from us, all right? Saying, we want to do things quickly and early. We're happy to communicate by, I think. So I think we're seeing a new model of care. with some face-to-face -face contact, but they'll also be much more virtual. So my whole clinic, so my whole clinic in the hospital now, is all virtual. So my patients are on telemedicine, so access them. My computer, which I'm using now, has electronic health record, has a virtual smart card, which I can access data. I can put data in, as I'm seeing them on my iPad, speak to them, put the letter in, all the data. I can do it from anywhere in the world now. And then what I can do at the end, is say they need an operation, but we have to consent them. We can do electronic consent. So I do the consent with them, it gets sent to them by a PDF, they sign it like a, like a DocuSign, and the whole thing is captured within half an hour. For the patient, all they have to do next is come to the operating theatre when they book an operation. It's all done. Mm -hmm. It's all remote. So this is the kind of thing we're experiencing now, where it's changed enormously. Um, we, I'm not going to go back, of course. So wherever you are in the world, you can still go to work, and it's just another day. And I've been there, I've been there for five days. For five years, I've been trying to do this. The society wasn't ready. Now I'm great because the same way you can do what you wanted to all around. Right? So I could be on holiday, yeah, doing a clinic for three four hours. It's all done. Very happy. Everyone's okay. It's managed. The other day, so you've seen these beam systems, I guess. They're these kind of um, telephone systems. It's like an iPad, uh, quite high up at your level, with a, with a kind of computer underneath, yeah, and you can it's move like it around. A robot. Like a robot. So I used that three or four years ago to do my keynotes, do virtual talks, virtual conferences, and also to do ward rounds and see patients. We weren't ready. I was a bit apprehensive three or four years ago on the wards and outpatients. When the pandemic started, I brought my sister back out again. Everyone's okay with it. So I can wander around the ward, do my ward rounds with my team. I can be anywhere. And I, I asked the patients, how do you feel? Absolutely fine. You were on the screen. We saw who you were. You had your name there. We were seen by you and we were entirely comfortable. Mm. So even that has changed. Now, three years ago, there would be more apprehension, but patients are not expecting different kinds of healthcare systems. So yes, the beam is great. I've been in the world with my laptop, have my beam, I need to be there. So yeah, so that's why I call me the virtual surgeon, of course, because I've always thought about this virtual makes sense. But why, why do we have to be there face to face? It's expensive, it's time consuming, right? It makes no sense to me whatsoever. And so, yeah, so I, I think we'll be moving on. And a question related to that topic is how do patients rea react to and adapt to the futuristic medicine? And I think what will be interesting to hear is also how do patients react when they see you as a robot? <laughs> so, I mean, what? They, so, as I said before, I think we've underestimated uh, our patients. They're much more tech side than we think they are. We've been very paternalistic. We know best. This is what we should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. Now they're saying, actually, we're happy with change. We're happy to be digital. We're happy to connect. But it's not for everyone. So what you have to remember, the certain groups that are more vulnerable, that may not have a computer, that may not have access to digital. So you have to make sure you allow healthcare for them as well as those that want to. You can't, because you have to drive the whole system together. So you have to allow that system to evolve itself. But those that can are now redesigning. You know, um, so... And when I got the feedback a few weeks ago from patients, unanimously, they're very supportive of innovation technology, they're happy to engage in different ways. They felt they were getting good outcomes, good experience in communication. So all the things that we were worried about, they have now said, we're happy with this, uh, almost, almost unanimously. And that's great for us. It means that we can keep driving um, into those journeys. So yeah, so I think uh, they are accepting more than we can. No, if you think about society, this is interesting, right? I, I, I take this image, um, I talk about it quite a lot, about the big software companies. 
let's talk about Uber or Amazon, yeah, or the food companies. So if you look at Uber or another taxi company like you know, Lyft or something, people look on their smartphones, they want to access the taxi almost immediately, within one or two minutes. If the app tells you that that taxi is like 30 or 40 minutes away, you get so upset because you want immediate access. Amazon, you want a book in two hours, or you want a device within 24 hours. You get upset if you take three weeks. Right? You're so annoyed that you, you'd rather go and shop and buy it yourself. And similarly with food, we expect food immediately to us. Society, society has moved on to immediate, immediate, immediacy. We, we, we can't wait. We're ready. We, we want things at our fingertips. The healthcare hasn't changed for a long time because we allow you guys to see a doctor. They say, oh, the appointment is three or four weeks' time. You accept it. But you wouldn't accept a taxi for more than two or three minutes. You don't get to see a doctor in three or four weeks. It made no sense. Now we see that change. Actually, we want immediate healthcare. We want to get better. I mean, pay now, not in three weeks' time. I wonder what's going on, right? Let's get back to normal. So we're now seeing that change. And patients, by society, want immediate healthcare. And that's what we're trying to provide. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So another question is, can medics adapt well to the software-oriented medicine? Um, I think the young doctors can. They're, they're brought up in a world of digital literacy. People like me are a bit more ancient, uh, and we struggle sometimes, okay? But generally, yes, I think the G doctors are tech savvy, they're digital savvy, it's a different world. We have to change the curriculum, as I said before, to educate the people about digital uh, work and transformation. So they're ready in this new world. Um, and I think what we've seen now is that the health system as a whole is evolving rapidly. So I think medics are ready. They don't have to be computer engineers. They don't have to design software, not at all. They have to understand the implications, what it means, the limitations, yeah? It's kind of the knowledge around it. We need the expertise from you guys to build the systems, yeah? So for example, one of the hospitals, one of the companies I work with as a non-exec director is called a medic fleet. And what we, we've created is a, a messaging tool, communication tool like WhatsApp for healthcare workers. So it's really well-designed, it allows this kind of uh, wall drive to happen, communication between doctors and healthcare workers, discharges, all based on a smartphone app. And so we've introduced that to the first hospital in the UK that went really, got rid of its pages. And the old pages, they kind of go off when it's emergency. We got rid of pages entirely from a hospital. Now we're using a WhatsApp tool called Medic Bleep. And what that taught us was about change management. How do you change from the bleep that we've been passionate about to something that's more intuitive? And we spent weeks going into the system, working with everybody in the, help, in the hospital to enable change management. So it's not about technology. It's not about software. It's change management. How do you design that thing? How do you work with the hospital to implement and translate and to show the effects and validate it, right? That's, that's the critical part of showing that case is going to work. Okay, so the last question that I have for you is, what would you say to the future medical practitioners and software engineers? And how would you inspire them to keep studying and strive for great innovations? So I, I think, that, so we're living in amazing times, right? This is really, for me, the most exciting time to be alive in medicine. Yeah, not five years ago, not 10 years ago, today. We are at what's called the inflection point of humanity. We're going through these rapid, exponential changes. So I think what I'd like people to go away is become those exponential thinkers. I want people to go away today and say, we're going to think bigger. We're going to make big changes, work together, collaborate, work with our networks to solve some of the global problems in healthcare and other verticals. And so my view when I leave this message to people is that basically I want you to not be a linear thinker and become an exponential thinker. The difference is this. Linear thinkers think in small steps, incremental steps, and there's little change. Some of that is necessary, but not entirely. So if I said to you, let's, Sonia, let me take 30 linear steps with you and go for a walk, we'd walk about 30 yards. You know that, right? It's sequential, it's predictable. If I said to Sonia now, let's take, let's think differently, let's take 30 exponential steps together, mm -hmm. how far do you think we'd get to? Infinite far. <laughs> We've gone around the planet 26 times. Mm -hmm. That's the pace of change. That's the mindset shift we need to encourage. Also, we need to give people the time to innovate. I'd love to, every institution to put innovation at the very heart and soul. 
giving people the time to think, giving people time to think differently about ideas, helping their minds change, bringing those amazing minds together, whether it's a, a engineers, computer scientists, doctors, biologists, whatever, in the same room, sharing those ideas, sharing passions. Then you see the ideas generate, and that's the only fundamental way we're going to make um, the change required for a fairer uh, world that we live in. And that's what we've, and hopefully that inspires your uh, students to think really outside the box, think big changes, how they work together and collaborate and share their skills with people like me, because we want to encourage it, foster it, and ensure that they um, have the right support necessary. Yeah, because actually by becoming software engineers, they can change the world. They can influence the future of medicine and not only medicine, every field that they feel um, they, they are changing, about, they're changing yeah. the world. They're changing immeasurably. They, they have changed the world already. Yeah, no question. Absolutely. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, so one more question we have. Uh, what keeps you and the people you work with motivated? Well, that's a really good question. At my design... So when I was training, first of all, is to be a good surgeon, to have good outcomes, be a, a I guess, um, be able to be, be competent as a surgeon. That took many years of my life. And I've been in clinical work for 27 years now. So to each every pinnacle, you'll be the best. And you're the best uh, for your patients. What drives me now is now to leave a legacy. How do I teach people, educate people on a global level? How do I break some of the geopolitical barriers around the world? How do I leave a legacy for global health? How do, what do I do now in my last kind of uh, quarter of my life, if you like, to leave a legacy that's substantial. With my experience, how do I drive innovation? How do I drive people to adopt new changes? Uh, so my legacy now is really about change, about improvement, redesign, reimagine, inspire. Uh, and those are the kind of things that I have a passion for. Those are things that I get inspired by on a day-to-day -day basis. Meeting people like you, Sanya, and people at the university. Uh, you know, we run Webit at, uh, in, in Bulgaria, of course, in the last few years. We meet the right people who help support our ambitions. It's about networking and, and, and kind of feeding off one another's energy and the energy to keep going and new ideas, yeah? And that's what I think really motivates me on a day-to-day -day basis of making a significant change and leave that legacy for the world, right? Great, so I think we have, um, no, we don't have any more questions. So I would like to thank you so much again for joining us today, Professor Ahmed. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about the future of medicine. And I would like to finish today's webinar with a quote from the father of the first surgical robots, as you mentioned, Leonardo da Vinci, which goes like, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Being willing is not enough, we must do. And I would like to wish everyone to apply their knowledge tirelessly and never cease to strive for innovation. Thank you for watching. Expect more IT talks on similar topics soon. And thank you again, Professor Ahmed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.